So namaste to all of you and welcome to this masterclass on the introduction into sexual tantra. And generally, it's an introduction into what tantra is and also what tantra is not. This word tantra is very mystified these days with a lot of connotations about what tantra is, what tantra is not. And it's time to get some clarity, some metaphysical clarity about what the system, this very ancient system in Indian spirituality is really about. I'll begin with this. In the world of spirituality, in the world of metaphysics, in the world of the mystics, the saints, the sages, the prophets of your, there has been various forms of spirituality being practiced across the planet. Some originating in India, some in the East, like the Taoism of Lao Tzu, some beyond that, like going to Japan, the Zen practices of Japan. And then as we go towards the Middle East, towards the West, we had Christianity, Islam, Judaism before that even. And these are the uh, forms of spirituality, some of them which are public for the masses, for many people, like the, the world religions are what we'd call in yoga the or in spirituality really we call them the exoteric forms of spirituality which means spirituality for everyone come one come all some spiritual teachings some spiritual doctrines some spiritual practices and inspirations are given to everyone and these forms of spirituality which cater to the masses these are called the exoteric spiritualities and then we have these spiritualities, which are not for the masses. They, they work with a different configuration. They work with some different um, requirements, let's say. And these forms of spirituality are usually, they're called esoteric, like the inner circle, a guru, a teacher, a saint, a mystic, a sage with his or her disciples, and uh, they are kind of not going too much out to the masses. And because these disciples, they, they fulfill certain requirements in their life, in their aspiration, their longing for the truth. They fulfill requirements in terms of their relationship with their teacher, this disciple guru or guru disciple relationship. And then the teacher teaches them some very exquisite set of methods, be that like in the Jewish culture there or Jewish environment, there is Judaism, which goes for everyone. And then you have the Kabbalah, which is for a select few people, which if they meet those requirements, they start getting initiations in Kabbalah. Similarly, in, uh, in Islam, in the Islamic environment, you have Islam as the exoteric spirituality for the masses. And then you have the Sufism, which is for the initiates and it works with different rules. In China, you have Buddhism as spirituality for the masses and you have Taoism as spirituality, which is more for the inner circle of initi initiates. Similarly, in Japan, you have Buddhism once again as the spirituality given to the masses. And then you have those people who are the spiritual practitioners in the form of the Zen, monks and the list goes on like this and in india exactly in the same way as you've had spirituality for the masses given in the form of the ancient religion brahmanism which then later was called was modulated a little bit and then it was called hinduism like hinduism emerged from brahmanism and that is for everyone and then in india there were spiritualities which were esoteric they weren't splashed out there. And these esoteric spiritualities were Vedanta and Tantra. And most of the world's, most of the spiritualities we've had, whether exoteric or esoteric, they follow a certain form of mentality, a certain philosophy, a certain outlook towards life a certain relationship to life. And that relationship to life is not hunky-dory. It's not a bed of roses. It's quite the opposite, actually. It's a relationship where 
the mystics, the spirit and the spiritualities that come from these mystics. And when I'm saying what I'm saying, I'm not saying that they are wrong. Far from that, they are right. From their perspective, it's very, very valid. From the perspective of these mystics, and you see it in your own life, you see it all around, that this life, even the good life, the average good life of the, of the average human being, or let's say it's a really good life, but what's the, the regular good life about? It's about having fun. It's about extracting as much fun and pleasure from this life. At least this is how it is in the modern times and for most people. Like, why do people live? What's the motivation of being alive? I wake up from bed today, for what? Am I living with certain ideals and principles? Or am I just shaft in the wind running after some desire, some fulfillment of some desire, whether that be a candy to suck upon, whether that be a sexual desire I want to fulfill, whether that be a desire for some new toy in my life, be it a car or a kid, you know, for most people, having a child is like, hey, hey, you know, and now let's get something else to entertain ourselves. You know, we're a bit bored with ourselves and we want one more thing. Somebody will love us and so on. So my point is what? My point is for these ascetics, remember, remember that word, ascetic meaning going away from this world, going away from life, going away from this the, the, the life as we know it, renouncing the world and turning your head away and saying, let the world go down the drain in its madness. I'm going to save my soul. And some of you are thinking, what is this guy rambling about? Because we came here to get an introduction into what sexual tantra is. I understand. But first I have to give you an introduction into what tantra is before you can understand correctly what sexual tantra is. So be patient. So these ascetic spiritualities, they look upon the world as an illusion. You must have heard the word samsara. You've heard the words Maya. These are words used by two different traditions. Vedanta calls this world a Maya, like a dream in a dream in a dream in a dream. And Buddhism calls this world Samsara. Samsara and Nirvana. And the choice is clear. If you are a person who is walking on the road less traveled, the road of spirituality, then you have to ditch the Samsara. You have to get away from Maya and you have to seek out your nirvana. You have to seek out your salvation. This idea that you have to renounce the world and everything of the world, renounce your family, renounce your friends, renounce fortune if you have any, or the idea of ever getting any, renounce it. Renounce the sex, renounce the drugs, renounce the rock and roll, renounce the relationships, renounce everything all your desires and attachments. You just turn away and you walk away like the Buddha did. Siddhartha, who was a prince, had a princely life. And one day he says, enough is enough. All of this is impermanent. All in his elevated consciousness, even the young Siddhartha realized that all of this is ephemeral. It comes and goes. Today you're young, tomorrow you're old. Today you're healthy, tomorrow you're ill. Today you're rich, tomorrow you're a beggar again. And he says, where is the consistency in this? There, this? There's no stability in this. Things come, things go. And people keep suffering because they keep attaching themselves to what is ephemeral, to what they can never hold on to. People cannot even hold on to their body, this body that we pamper so much. When death comes, this body is gone. And you can try as much as you want to, <laughs> to cling to it. You know the outcome of that, right? It doesn't work. So ashes to ashes, dust to dust, everything goes away. Everything is in a flux. Everything is flowing. And what you have now in this moment is simply what you have in the moment. And at any time, things are going to change. Everything is changing anyway. You don't see how, how it's so small, the changes in every moment. But you see in life, things on, keep on changing. And because of this drama, the dramas of life, most people are getting very, very distracted. 
They wake up in the morning and then it's this saga, it's the family saga, it's the relationship saga, for the better or worse. But it's still a saga, it's still a soap opera, right? Then you're getting dressed, you're going to eat your breakfast, you're going to do your job, you come back home, and it's about making the money and going on vacation and la 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 la. And the mystics say, listen, this life, live like this, even if it's a fantastic life, and your karma is you enjoying some really good karma at the moment, this life is nothing. This life is a tip of the iceberg compared to the real unconditioned happiness. Unconditioned, it has no cause, it has no condition that emerges in you from the knowing of yourself. And I don't mean knowing yourself as your name, your personality, your ego. And that's, that's obvious if you didn't know that. Straight jacket. We know our superficial identity. But when death comes, who are you going to be? What are you? Are you a man? Are you a woman? When death comes, do you have a gender? Will everything just disappear with death? Will something continue? Will you continue even though your body is gone? Then in which way, in which form? If would you have a name? And where are you going? Very big questions, right? And we tend to postpone and say, ah, how I think about this right now. Why poison my life right now thinking about this? Just let's live and let's make merry and everything is going to be good, right? No, not really. Living unconsciously. Yeah, we hear this thing, oh, uh, ignorance is bliss, say the ignorant people. And Buddha the wise says, no, no, no. Ignorance is not bliss. Ignorance is the cause of suffering. And as long as the spiritual ignorance continues, the suffering continues. So the mystics having tasted the wine of consciousness, the drunkenness of consciousness, the truth of who they really are and what this reality really is about, where it comes from and where it goes, they have said, wake up, people, wake up, wake up and shine. Swami Shivananda says, eating, sleeping, procreating. A little laughter <laughs> and a lot of tears. And he says, is this what life is about? Stand up, wake up, realize who you are. Don't die like a worm on the planet. So the mystics having tasted the divine life, are saying this life of attachment, this life of, of uh, the dance between the yin and the yang, endlessly trapped in samsara, with karma being the prison, the chains that hold you here, is a pseudo life compared to the divine life. And they have urged people to seek out the truth. And they have formulated parts, again, those which go ascetic, most of them, and those ascetic parts, coming back to this point, they are leaving the world, you leave the world, you leave everything, you renounce everything, and you go away. And you don't pamper the body because the body is a dream and a dream and a dream and a dream. You don't pamper your sexuality because the sexuality is a dream and a dream and a dream and a dream. You don't pamper nothing. And that's why in the ascetic spiritualities, Islam, Judaism, Christianity, Buddhism, big time, Vedanta from India, most of the yogas, most of the yogis of yore were living lives of ascetic. They were not in the world, people of the world, doing any spirituality in the world. They went away, far away, and did some really hardcore practices. Milarepa, he leaves the world, he goes to a cave in the mountains of Tibet in the 12th century, and he stays there alone without seeing anyone for 30 years, practicing big time. That's ascetic. You know, it's kind of rough, it's very determined, and the idea is, we have to save ourselves from the samsaric delusion and to wake up to the truth of who we are. Okay. And most spiritualities go like this. And then you have this path called Tantra in India. And the path of Tantra was at one point in the Indian history very there, very present. And then with the invasion of the Muslims, the Portuguese and the British over about a thousand years, and though each of those came with their ascetic spirituality, their life-denying spirituality, 
they couldn't understand Tantra because Tantra works in another way. Tantra gets you to the same peak of the mountain that all these ascetic forms of spirituality get you. The Tantra operates from another angle. It climbs the mountain with another path, another road. And it looks like, hey, you're lost. But no, there's another path that goes to the same goal of supreme realization. And this is what this Indian Tantra is about. I cannot say it enough. Most people, when they hear the word Tantra, they hear something about some form of Kama Sutra, erotic, exotic sex from India, in which you, you know, you do orgies and massage and lingam massage and yoni massage and whatnot, this, that, and the other. And none of that is really Tantra. In fact, in the tantric tradition, there is no lingam massage and yoni massage. These are modern day inventions, good ones. They fit. They can help a lot in many ways for people with sexual blockages, you know, traumas and whatnot. They can help. But back in the day when tantra was, was uh, alive in India, people didn't have these blockages and they didn't have all kinds of shit on sex and puns on sex and guilt and shame because tantra looks upon life in a different way. The tantric mentality or the tantric view on life is that this world is not just some form of delusion or illusion, a dream that you piss upon and you turn your back to it and you walk away. For the tantric mystics and for the tantric path, this world is simply the other aspect of that same one undivided cosmic consciousness that some people call God in the tantric tradition. This principle is called Shiva the divine aspect as Shiva. And in Tantra, Shiva always comes with his beloved, with his consort, his cosmic and eternal beloved, which is Shakti. And the Tantric say, you may block yourself, you may want to look away from Shakti, but Shakti is present everywhere. Shiva and Shakti, these two cosmic principles, the male principle, Shiva, and the female principle, Shakti, infiltrate the whole universe. They are the cause of it and they are the resorption of it and they are the ones who maintain it. Everything, says Tantra, is born out of the love making of Shiva and Shakti. And Shiva and Shakti are present here and now everywhere. And Shiva represents that aspect which is of the nature of pure consciousness the supreme, undivided, undifferentiated cosmic void, which is absolute, perfect. And the words are just fingers pointing to a moon, remember. There is no way these words can give you any idea of what the Shiva consciousness is, but they can inspire you to look at the moon and experience the moon yourself through your own meditations, practices, and so on. So that aspect is the Shiva aspect. And then Shakti is everything manifested. Shakti is everything that is this whole universe. The body of Shiva is Shakti. The energy of Shiva is Shakti. The power of Shiva is Shakti. The consciousness of Shakti is Shiva. And they can never be separate. Everywhere in the universe you have manifestations of plus and minus as polarity. You have in the atoms, plus and minus. You have it in electricity, plus and minus. You have it in magnetism, plus and minus. You have it everywhere in the universe, pluses and minuses, pluses and minuses. Our mathematics is made up of pluses and minuses. Chemistry is made up of pluses and minuses. You are made up of pluses and minuses. And in every form, in your atoms, but not just every man and every woman within themselves, beyond their physical body, like as part of the aura, have the plus and the minus, the male aspect and the inner, like for me as a man, my inner woman, which I may either know and be connected to, aware of, or she's sleeping somewhere dormant in me. For a woman, she has a manifested shakti, the feminine, feminine aspect, but within her there is the inner man, the Shiva aspect. It's unavoidable. It's the Shiva Shakti is everywhere. And the Tantrics are saying, what you call samsara to the ascetics, we, we know her to be Shakti. And the Tantrics 
they reveal the Divine Mother. They reveal Shakti. They have different forms of the Shakti, the one Maha Shakti, as the, the ten great Mahavidya Devis. And therefore, the Tantrics, because of this major difference in the way they look upon this reality, not as an illusion to be shunned, but as the Divine Mother to be worshipped, and then make friends with your mother, make pray to your mother, do yoga pract practices and beseech your mother's grace. And the Divine Mother, Shakti, will take you into pure consciousness. She will be your ladder that you climb to evolve into the state of Supreme, the Buddhahood, the Nirvana, the Nirvikalpa Samadhi. So, because of this, the Tantrics, they engage in the world, but they engage in the world in a very special way. They do not engage in the world with ignorance. They engage in the world with lucidity and a certain perspective, a clear spiritual perspective and vigilance. People keep saying when they come to a tantric school, they say, give us some mantras, blah, blah, blah. And of course, there are many mantras and people get initiations as they progress in, on, tantric, on the tantric path. But uh, very often I tell people, you know what your mantra should be? Vigilance, vigilance, vigilance. Are you vigilant? Are you aware? Are you awake? Are you just living your life in the world, sleeping it away unconsciously? Unconscious desires that grip you, unconscious uh, attachments, subconscious tendencies that direct your choices, behaviors in every moment. And I'm just a puppet to my karma, to my samskaras, you know, to these subconscious imprints, they call tendencies subconscious ones that you carry from previous lives and they keep budding and show tendencies in your life and we just live them out unconsciously. The Tantrics say this is not the way to live, even live in the world of Shakti. And the Tantrics therefore, inspired by the grace of the Divine Consciousness, they have parts of metaphysical direction, spiritual parts, which are there to bring about this awakening but not by leaving the world, not by neglecting the body, not by being in the world and using the resources, energies of the world. Therefore, in the, under the umbrella of Tantra, Tantra has many different parts of spirituality under its roof. And every one of those parts of spirituality are based upon the same tantric metaphysics which I told you just now. That life is not just an illusion. It's the other side of the divine aspect. If Shiva is this side, Shakti is this side. If, the, if this is Nirvana, you know, the cosmic void, then this so-called samsara is the divine mother. Because they're always together. And therefore, the tantric mystics, they brought us the path of Hatha Yoga. The path of Hatha Yoga is a path, it's a tantric path because you use the body, you use the energies of the body, and you start with body consciousness and the body awareness, but you end up in the spiritual consciousness. Hatha Yoga is not a path of stretching your body, it's not a path of becoming more flexible, it's not a path of shaping and trimming your body and wearing fashionable clothes, lululemons, and then doing some kind of a fashion show in a, in a hypocritical yoga class. That's what modern Hatha Yoga has become. This, it's, this is a farce. It's a monkey yoga. And people get offended, but hey, the word yoga means union, to bring together, fusion and attuning. That's what the word yoga means. Go out and ask people doing yoga, even this Hatha Yoga thing, when they do some asanas and ask them, you just did this asana, what yoga happened? What was the yoga? Because you did a yoga practice, right? So what yoga happened? And you'll see they have no answer. They say, I have had a stretch here and I feel... But the word yoga doesn't mean stretching, my dears. It doesn't mean flexibility. That you get stretched and you get flexible is a good thing. It's a very good thing. It's nice to be stretched and feel flexible and, you know, limber in your body. That's good. The word yoga don't mean that at all. 
Hatha yoga means something completely different. But then the modernism, the essence of the yogas are lost to be replaced with some kind of external copying, a bad external mimicking of an internal process that is happening, even as you make your asanas and pranayamas, which makes yoga yoga, which actually creates a unification between you and the beneficial energies, the superior elevated energies of the universe that's transforming you. Anyway, one over the other, Hatha Yoga is there to elevate your consciousness, starting with your physical body consciousness, and then eventually emerging in the spiritual consciousness to go from, from the Alpha to the Omega, to the Spirit. And this is the genius of Tantra. The genius of Tantra is it starts you where you are. And if you're, and most people are, if you're a person who's a body conscious person, like, you know, I am my body and it's pampering the body. Okay, we can start you from there. And then this form of yoga, this form of tantric yoga called Hatha Yoga is taking you from the body to the spiritual awareness in its own course, in its own time. But it works with the body. Buddhism does not work with the body. Vedanta does not work with the body. For them, the body is an illusion. And to do Hatha Yoga, because they don't understand what really what Hatha Yoga is. And I, can, I get it because their path, their, their path is different. And the way they see when people make Hatha Yoga, what's going on. Even I would say that Hatha Yoga is not, a, it's a disaster when it comes to a spiritual evolution. They don't work with it, but Tantra does. Exactly in the same way. And now we get to the big point of this this uh, masterclass. Exactly in the same way, Tantra works with the sexual resources. It works with the sexual energy, the sexual desire, the sexual attractions, the sexual attachment even of the human being, man or woman, both the genders. And Tantra says, listen, we are not going to just sweep sex under the carpet and pretend, oh, oh, mm, mm, grrr like the rest of the spiritualities do. Why do the rest of the spiritualities go against sex? I mean, I'm saying it like it is, but it is. Have you not noticed? What's Buddhism's view on sex? If you are a real, like, solid Buddhist practitioner as a man or a woman, are you allowed sex? No. You have to take the vows of celibacy. As Buddha did, when he finished his career as a husband. When he became a monk, Buddha was celibate for the rest of his life. Celibate means no sex, zilch, zero sex. Not with your left hand or your right hand in your dreams, not, not with nothing, it's finished. Christianity has the same view. If you, you're on a path of Christianity as a path of evolution, fast, fast, and you become a Christian monk or a nun, Vows of chastity for all your life. It's the same with Islam. It's the same in, in Zen. So my point is in most spiritualities, which are these ascetic spiritualities, the sex is a no-no. It's an absolute no-no. And for good reason why. I'll tell you why. Because this, let's look at what Buddha said. Buddha said, to his, uh, to his monks, I'm a bit hesitating because it sounds kind of sexist and in this world of uh, people who are so sensitive with these things, um, you know, you can't even say what the Buddha said, but I'm going to say it and it's nothing sexist in it. He says to his male monks, oh monks, it's better you dip your dick in a jar of red hot coals, burning coals, than in the vagina of a woman. Implying what? He's not having some issues with the vagina or the woman. The point is, he's talking to Zemil Monk saying, if you have sex, it's your way to perdition, it's your way to hell. If he had female Sangha, he would have said something about, you know, something equivalent to the women. Like, don't put that dick in you, you know, it's, it's a no-no in this way. Why? Because the mystics, whether it be Buddha or whether it be Patanjali, whether it be Rumi or whoever it is, every single one has come to the realization that 
all your desires and all your attachments keep you locked in the samsaric state of consciousness. Listen, when we say, hey, the world is samsara, when the mystics, the Buddhists, and whoever else say the world is all maya and samsara, right? That's bullshit. That's like a kindergarten way of putting it. And for kindergarten people, it sounds okay. Like it, it works. It's not true. The world is not samsara. It's your consciousness that is samsaric. Samsara is in you. It's your mind that's samsaric. If I wear pink glasses on my eyes, pink filters on my eyes, and then everything starts looking pink, and I say the whole world is pink. The trees are pink, the leaves are pink, the sky is pink, the water is pink, everything is pink. The stars are pink. And you say, no, they're not. I say, I can see that they're all pink. And you say, dude, you have glasses in front of your eyes which are pink and therefore the whole world looks pink, right? Well, the truth is, most people, their consciousness, their, their samsaric consciousness makes everything pink. When my consciousness is samsaric, this thing with me and you, I am me, you are you. This is not me, I am this. This is mine, that's not mine. This duality, which we are so comfortable with, which we are so delighted with, which we cling to, you know, big time. This duality is a samsara. The truth is you are not just this body. The truth is you are like in, at, that, at, the, at the level of spiritual consciousness, you are everyone, you are everything. Not that you have something, you are it. If you have a phone, you say, okay, I'm me and this is my phone. This is a phone and it's my phone, right? That's your samsara. Truth is the phone is you. I know, yeah. <laughs> sounds crazy. But that's because of the ignorance, the filters you have in your consciousness that don't let you see through this, this delusion. Anyway, the point is, as the mystics have said again and again, as long as you have a single desire and attachment left to this world, you cannot emerge in the nirvanic consciousness. You will not be able to know the truth, the divine truth. That truth that Jesus says, know the truth and the truth shall set you free. The truth that frees, implying that right now, not knowing the truth, you are not free. You are bound, bound by karma, bound in samsara. And if you think otherwise, then I have a challenge for you just to give you a little wake up call. If you think you're all free, then try to get out of the cycle of evolution. Get out of it. See if you can get out. Even if you kill yourself, which I don't recommend at all, you're still in it. You're still going to go through the bardo and you know all the subtle processes. You're not out of it. What is that truth that will set you free? For that, one has to relinquish all desires and all attachments, all of them. And the ascetics do it by walking away from it. You walk away from the world. You walk away from all the worldly desires, attachments. Of course, you just can't walk away from them 100%. And therefore, you, you kind of don't, you, it's not in your face anymore because you go live in a forest, a desert, a cave, a monastery, an ashram, something. And you're, you're not, it's not in your, in your direct vicinity anymore, the object of your desires and attachments. And then in your monastery, cave, desert, wherever you are, you do tons of yoga, meditation, prayer, whatever is that path. And you burn out those seeds of those desires and attachments through the spiritual practice. And every time a desire comes on the ascetic direction, you immediately look at it, you watch it, you invest no energy in it, you don't give it any attention you simply watch it come and watch it go like you do in Vipassana meditations. And then you double up your practice of prayer. Like, oh, I'm, I'm a monk in a monastery and now I have a sexual desire. I'm not supposed to indulge and say, oh, 
it's been so long. Oh, I, I'm, I'm a virgin. Should I not at least get fucked once in my life? Don't, no indulgence. There comes a desire, watch it come, watch it go. And pray like crazy, meditate like crazy. Confess to your confessor or your master, your guru. Guruji, I'm having sexual desires. And then the guru says, go and do karma yoga like this. Well, you know, channel it somewhere else. Get your head out of it. Don't invest anything. Basically, what happens in is 10, 15, 20 years of simply not putting any attention in the desire or your attachments, they die. The reason they are alive is because we feed them. I'm having a desire for Tom Yam soup. But I feed it. I say, yeah, wouldn't that be nice? Mm, I kind of smell it. I taste it. And then my mind goes, and when shall I have it? Oh, I'll have it for dinner. Where will I get it from? I'm going to get it from there. I'll eat there. I look forward to it. I invest my mind and my energies into the desire. And the desire grows like a balloon. I blow energy in it and it goes whoop, 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 bigger and bigger. And when it gets really big, I cannot even control it anymore. It's like the desire puppets me. You know what I'm talking about. I must have it. Right? That's not what the ascetics do. They snatch the energy away from the desire. Every time it comes, they snatch the energy away. And it's like you take a plant and you pull it out of the mud. So it has no nourishment. You wrap it in, in plastic so it has no air. You put it in a dark corner so it has no sun. What's going to happen to this plant that gets no nourishment in any form? It will die. It has no solar energy, no telluric energy and nutrients of the earth and no air, no prana from the air. The plant will die. You starved it, right? It's the same thing with the attachments and the desires. You snatch the energy out and they die. This is the ascetic way of dealing with it. The tantrics have a different way, a different angle of dealing with it. But my point was to come to this desire story, which is your biggest desire and your strongest attachment top, in your top three. If you're a man or a woman now listening to me, what is your strongest desire? Hmm? Chocolates, Pad Thai, pizza, Disneyland. Where does sex come into this one? How strong is your sexual libido? How strong is your sexual desire? Especially if you're young, dumb and full of calm, as the American proverb says. Listen, if you're, in, if you're 80 years old and you're, you're listening now, you're like, yeah, man, I know I'm 80 years old. I don't feel so much libido. Maybe you do, but... Most 80-year-old people are like, you know, that, that phase of mine is gone and I'm listening out of a certain curiosity what this tantra and what the sexual tantra is about. But if you're, you know, more young and your sexual hormones are raging, do you realize how strong the sexual desire is in you? If an angel of God comes right now and tells you, I will give you eternal life right now, but you... No more sex for you. That's your, that's your deal. You give me your sex, I'll give you eternal life right now. I'll give you omniscience, omnipresence, and omnipotence. All-knowing, all-powerful, ever-presence. That's what you get. No sex. Would you go for it? You see how strong that attachment is? That even if the angel of God would come right now and slap you with nirvana, you'd, but the condition is you, you no sex for you, you'd be like, nah, I'd rather keep my sex than eternal life. That's how strong the sexual desire and the sexual attachment is in most people. And from this desire come more than 90% of all your other desires. Think about it. Check it out. Put an awareness into your desires for the next week and see how much of your daily life desires come from your sexual desire. That's the root of it. I could explain, I could give examples one after the other and speak till midnight, just giving you examples. You meditate upon it. Hmm? And then the ascetics say, well, if 
this desire is so strong in people and this attachment to sex is so strong and from it so many other desires are coming and desires are the ones that keep you stuck in your samsaric blindness then fuck the sex then we simply terminate it with this with this heroic uh, style of jesus when he says if your right eye prevents you from entering the kingdom of heaven pluck it out if your right hand prevents you from entering the kingdom of heaven chop it out is better to not have an eye and not an arm if they prevent you from entering the eternal life exactly in the same way if your sexuality your sexual desires and sexual attachments keep you like this you're fucked up look at life my dears is it a bed of roses is your life a little laughter and a lot of tears check properly look deeply look into your own heart look into your mind look into your self are you fulfilled are you still running for happiness here there everywhere are you chasing happiness in the form of relationships she love me he love me are you searching validation and conformism from other people and when you have it you feel good and when you don't when it's taken away you go in a in a crisis are you chasing sex for attention validation to feel loved are you chasing money to feel good about yourself do you like it when people appreciate you and think good about you what if people start thinking shit about you there is no stability in it we are constantly trying to support ourselves with crutches from out there trying to make ourselves feel good and you know that shit is going to be swept under your feet anytime thus the insecurity in life in relationships then they come all the rules in society and relationships to try to feel secure but has it ever worked has anybody found the true happiness are you still searching for happiness in this and that and the other because if you are you ain't found it yet because if you found it you wouldn't be searching common sense right how long is this madness going to continue ask yourself you want to continue living like a jellyfish you want to continue living like like a like chaff in the wind what do they say about me do they like me do you love me when you say you love me i feel so good there's only one destination in this way trouble and suffering if you think otherwise you're contesting the teachings and the and the mystical insight of the buddha of jesus and all the sages all the male and female sages saints prophets past present you're contesting it and your life will show you eventually who's right whether the buddhas are the, are right or your ego is correct so back to the point the desire that desire has to go and the ascetics terminate that desire by simply stepping away from it and burning it out by by detach by renouncing it all desires but i'm i'm focusing more on the sexual desire over here similarly desire and attachment it's burnt out eventually the tantrics are having a different approach this reason i just told you is why most spiritualities go against sex and tantra is coming with this and since tantra says sex is holy i mean what are shiva and shakti doing in their own way in their own meta physical way what are shiva and shakti doing together everywhere in the universe wherever they are in their own way in that particular form and manifestation shiva and shakti are making love their union is a union of love making a sexual a, a love making in sex a love making in heart and a love making in consciousness and whatever is in between that the symbol in which is in every temple in india you will find it is this symbol of the lingam and the yoni the yoni lingam symbol which is the symbol that represents the erect 
phallus of Shiva, lingam, meaning uh, it's like a, a saber, like the lightsaber of Luke Skywalker, a pillar of light. It's the pillar of the light of consciousness. Shiva's lingam is the pillar of cosmic light, prakasha. And the yoni means the lotus flower. And the lingam of Shiva is penetrating the yoni of Shakti. And this symbol is in every temple in India. And the Indians are putting flowers on it, ghee on it, milk on it, asking blessings from it, and this and that. And it's a, it's a completely sexual symbol. And the tantrics, that's what they say, the whole universe is the child is born out of the love making of Shiva and Shakti, is sustained by the love making of Shiva and Shakti. And it is to that sublime love making, it is resolved back into its source. So for the tantrics, love, uh, love making, sexuality ain't a sin, it's glorious. And because tantra, just like with the body, it, the path, it embraces the energies of the world and the sexual energy in such a vehement, such a powerful energy in people. It says, why would you sweep this one under the carpet? Let's see if we can put it to work. Let's see if we can use that energy towards the spiritual evolution. And they found out, yes, yes, that there is, and because they realized this mystical power in the sexuality, the mystical power in the love making. I mean, it's under your noses, my dear. It's in the form of your orgasm. What is an orgasm? What happens in an orgasm? Anyone who's had an orgasm, or plenty of them, they will agree when I say it's a state of complete bliss. It's a state in which you forget about yourself. If in an orgasm, you're still at, about you, 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 me, 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 that's not an orgasm. Then you don't know what an orgasm is. But in an orgasm, you are gone. You are so gone, gone, gone. The problem is for most men and women, this orgasm comes for just a, a moment. Says the man, honey, I'm coming, I'm coming. Ha, 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 ha. Oh, splash, 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 splash. Oh. And the woman says, hey, no, I'm not even started over here. Do something, you know, get up. And the guy is like, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> right? You know what I'm talking about, you know. Anyway, for most people, it comes too quick. It goes too quick. But even in that quick little quickie orgasm, what happens? You are blown to bits. Even after it, you're in a kind of an ecstasy, oh my God, right? Well, the tantrics looked upon the orgasm. They meditate into the orgasm. There is this form of yoga, which is a tantric sexuality, where the man and the woman come together and they make love. In this form of yoga, you don't just make love the usual way. You make love in a consecrated way. You make love and on the tantric, the sexual tantric yoga, your intention is not just to lose yourself in pleasure. It's to sublime your orgasms and to sublime your sexual energy and to come out in the cosmic consciousness and to come out in the who am I, the truth of that. To know the truth, that will set you free. That in all these different tantric paths, bhakti yoga, karma yoga, hatha yoga, nidra yoga, this and that yoga, there is a path in which the sexuality, the sexual interactions are the yoga practice. You make love, but you make love with a very keen awareness, a very keen vigilance, and with a motivation, as I said, way, way, way bigger and elevated than just discharging some energy and having fun and pleasure. There is a lot of fun and there's a lot of pleasure you can have on the path of sexual tantra. But if you come to sexual tantra thinking that's what it's about, you are going to just suffer. The goal is something much, much higher, much bigger. And that is the evolution of your consciousness till truth, using the sex. And in this path, 
the, the desires and the attachments are conquered, you will get detached to sex. You will sublime your sexual desire and attachments, but in another way, not by denying it, not by turning away from it, but by going in it, by going through it, by experiencing it, and experiencing a lot, it a lot, but with vigilance, with an awareness. Making love in the tantric way is consecration, transfiguration, using mantras, subliming the sexual energy, elevating the, the quality of the orgasms up along the chakras. Like, can you imagine what it would be to make an orgasm in your heart chakra? The regular orgasm men and women have is, is happening in terms of the chakra uh, correspondence somewhere around Muladhara, the root chakra and the second chakra, Swadhisthana. It's a mixture of these two. And it's gross, it's heavy, it's discharging. Oh. The tantric orgasms are orgasms that go high, sublimed orgasms. And those sublime orgasms equal to spiritual states of consciousness. And the higher you go, the better it is. If you will have an orgasm in your crown chakra, go on, on, on and on and on and on and on, you enter cosmic consciousness. In what I was saying between the lines is that the tantric sexuality is not about split second orgasms. It's about prolonged orgasms. It's about keeping the sexual fluids in, not discharging them, holding them, transmuting the energy of your own sexual fluids and subliming that energy higher, refining their frequency and investing them in your higher chakras, in higher states of consciousness. And then when you orgasm in Anahata chakra, in your heart chakra, ecstasy of ecstasies, your orgasm in your ajna ends like penetrating insight that cuts through the, the wheels of stupidity, ignorance, and delusion. Mixed with a lot of ecstasy, can't even call it pleasure anymore, but it's ecstatic and it's spiritualizing, it's evolving. And then how do we do this? How do we transform the sexuality into this from the explosive sexuality whose intention is fun and pleasure to the spiritual sexuality in which the sexual energy is imploded and put to work, resulting in the spiritual evolution. This is where the path of sexual tantra comes in and teaches you this elevated, refined form of spirituality, which has as its goal nirvana, cosmic consciousness. Now I hope you get a better understanding of what sexual tantra is. Because in the world out there, people keep thinking sexual tantra is about uh, yoni massage, lingam massage, pleasure, 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 pleasure. Your pleasure, your orgasmic pleasure is not the goal. If you make that your goal, don't come to Tantra. You're better off without it. The sexual pleasure is your donkey, your ride to cosmic consciousness. Your goal is somewhere else. Pleasure is your vehicle. Well, what a vehicle. What a donkey to ride. Ecstatic pleasure. But you have to focus it. You have to direct that orgasmic ecstasy to your spiritual target, then it's sexual tantra. And of course, this is basically the starting point. It's just an introduction, what I'm telling you just now, what it is. Things go way, 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 way deeper in on this path. It's a path. There's so much to learn. Metaphysics, the tantric metaphysics, there's so much to learn. There's so much to practice, so much to realize. It's a, it's a path like every other path. It's not a fly-by-night, overnight kind of a thing. But it's a path that uses the sexuality and eventually comes out in cosmic consciousness with a detachment to the desire and the attachments to it. Because you, you, you did it. You went through it with vigilance. As you went through it, you kept taking it up, refining it, and now you are free of the sexual desire and attachment, just like the ascetics, but going 
another route. This is the, an introduction for you about what is sexual tantra. The word itself, the word tantra, it means a warp of interconnections. That everything in this universe is connected to everything. You may not see it, and yet there are energy connections, connections of energy, connections of mind, and connections in consciousness. Everything is interconnected. And the tantric practices, not just the sexual things, but the other yogas and tantra, hatha, this, that, and the rest, they are all bringing your awareness to these connections, or many of them at least, between you, the microcosm, and the universe, the macrocosm, so that you have a conscious relationship with the universe and everything it contains. Ultimately, to what aim? Cosmic consciousness, enlightenment, what Buddha called nirvana. Now, I see an R is almost up since I started, and I'm going to end now by letting you know that on on this coming Saturday and Sunday, and I didn't see the dates. <clears throat> Let's see. So on the 6th and 7th of March, this Saturday, Sunday, I'm holding a workshop about exactly this, the introduction into sexual tantra what it is, what it's not. I gave you some insights already, but we're going to look upon these things about, the ta about desire, attachment in more detail and the tantric solution to it. We are going to look upon what are the essential, the basic essential teachings of Tantra in terms of brahmacharya, holding the sexual energy as men and women, the vital force, how to sublime it, what are the consequences of holding the energy versus losing it? What's the secret of the orgasm? How to, to, to use this, the hidden power, the spiritual opportunity of the orgasm? And we're going to look upon the, again, the basics of what Tantra, the, the practical things in Tantra. And of course, we're going to look upon this, the curves of pleasure for men and women and how when men and women make love in ignorance, how things can be a complete disaster, but by understanding that the sexuality of the men and the sexuality of the women have certain commonalities, and yet they have many differences, and by understanding those differences and coming to a certain common, uh, certain understanding, but a spiritual understanding, a tantric understanding, men and women can fulfill each other in the love making, enjoying a very harmonious and happy sexual life together. And again, I keep on insisting, that's not the point of Tantra, but there's much more in Tantra than just having a great sex life. But some people say, I want to just have an amazing sexual life. Men say, I want to have to be an amazing lover and feel good like this. Women say, I want to feel feminine and this, that, and orgasm amazingly. Sure, sure, it's your life, you know, enjoy it. I would still take this workshop, yoking it to the star of consciousness, to the star of evolution, the goal of evolution, but then you will decide how far you want to go with this thing. And this is going to be an opportunity coming on 6th and 7th. The timings of this workshop will be, it's going to be four hours per day. So it's an eight hour workshop in total. And the timings are 12 p.m. to 2 p.m. Thai time. And then one hour break. And then 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Thai time. Saturday, Sunday. I hope some of you will join me for this workshop and let's go on this journey of sexual tantra. Enough of it for now. If you've been listening, thank you for listening and may you be blessed. Namaste.